I opened up my Bible and began to read and and it so rebukes human wisdom that I knew by the time I got to the end of chapter three that I was lost and needed Christ. And so this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture, and it always speaks directly to my heart. And Paul directs their hearts to the message of the cross, which he says is the wisdom and the power of God. And then he closes chapter three with this summary, chapter three, verses 21 through 23. Therefore, let no man glory in men for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. And the point is this. Anyone who would have the sort of factious sectarian attitude that pits Paul against Apollos or sets Peter against the other apostles, a person like that can only be motivated by one thing, and that is sinful pride, pride in human wisdom or pride in one's spiritual pedigree or simply a proud, contentious attitude that despises harmony in the body of Christ and seeks to exploit itself or exalt itself at the expense of others. It was carnal pride. And Paul says so plainly, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, whereas there is among you this envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of, Apo I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? So he lays it on the line with him. He tells him this is just carnality. Now, if there had been any tendency in the, po the Apostle Paul himself to cultivate that kind of carnal pride, he might have sided with the Paul party and argued that the followers of Paul, the ones who were saying, I am of Paul, those are the best Christians. You know, I, I confess that I would be tempted to do that. But he doesn't say that. Chapter three, verses five through seven. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God who gives the increase. And he regarded himself as nothing but a servant. And he urged the Corinthians to have that same perspective about themselves. Now, that brings us to chapter four. Look at chapter four. He starts by saying once more that he's nothing but a steward of the gospel. His teaching was not Paul's own personal philosophy. It was a message that was committed to him as a steward. And the same was true of Apollos and Peter and all the apostles. Verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So there was no need to pit Paul against Peter. They were stewards accountable to the same master. And a steward is accountable only to his master. It doesn't matter how other men judge him. It really doesn't matter. The only thing that counts is if his master considers him faithful. Verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Paul was willing to stand or fall by how God judged him. And he urged the Corinthians to stop comparing Paul and Peter and, and Apollos and leave all those judgments about men and and their, and their different styles of teaching and whatnot to God alone in his perfect time. Why? Because this sectarian spirit was cultivating fleshly pride among the Corinthians, and that was the root of all the other sins there. Verse 6, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. See, their sectarianism was not only erroneously pitting Paul against Apollos. And Paul and Apollos, they weren't competitors. They weren't enemies. But these people were pitting them against each other. And it was also causing the Corinthians themselves to be puffed up and arrogant against one another. And so you had one group saying, well, we like Paul because of the depth of his teaching and the soundness of his doctrine. He's a great theologian and we're the best Christians because we're the finest theologians. And you had another group saying, well, we follow Apollos because he's the most eloquent orator. He's the finest preacher and the best motivator. And we're the best Christians because we've accumulated the biggest following. And then there was a third group saying, well, we prefer Peter because his teaching is so practical and so down to earth. We're the best Christians because our faith is more practical and less theoretical than all the rest of you. 
And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, there was even a fourth faction, the super spiritual ones, you know. There are always people like this who said, we reject all those labels. You know, we're, we follow no human teacher and no system. We are of Christ. Christ alone, no creed. And in the name of love and unity, we reject and exclude all the rest of you. And so you can see how that sort of sectarian spirit naturally fosters pride and arrogance. And even in the people who thought they were the most spiritual because they only follow Christ. Paul says that even that's not good. They were, in Paul's words, puffed up for one and against another. That expression, puffed up, I love. It appears seven times in the Bible, six times right here in 1 Corinthians, and once in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. And this is the first time it appears, right here. It's from the a Greek word that means inflated. It's just, just what it means, inflated. And it speaks of a scornful, unloving kind of arrogance. Puffed up is a great way to translate it. Look how Paul uses it throughout this epistle. Look down in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 4. He mentions those who were puffed up or arrogant against him personally because they were saying he's not going to come back and see us in person. And in chapter 5, verse 2, he mentions people who were puffed up with arrogance rather than being humbled by the fact that someone in their midst was living in gross immorality. And that's a really bad kind of puffed up. They were proud about their tolerance of sin in their midst. And then in ver chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And in chapter 13, verse 4, he says that one of the characteristics of love is that love is not puffed up. And so to be puffed up is to have an inflated ego. That's the bottom line. It is a description of fleshly pride, the very root of this problem. It's inherently unloving. And in fact, it, because he connects it with love the way he does in chapter 13, you could accurately say this is the very antithesis of love, to be puffed up. And yet that sort of pride was a particular problem among the Corinthians. It was the kind of attitude a corrupt culture like that would naturally tend to foster. And it was the very thing that had caused this young church to divide up into these competing factions. And Paul says that sort of inflated, arrogant ego has no place, absolutely no place in the church. And in order to get them to face their arrogance for what it was, he poses this brief series of three questions to them. And all three questions are in this one verse we're looking at tonight. Look at the verse again, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who makes you different from someone else? And what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you didn't? And I want to consider those questions tonight one at a time and try to draw from them the lessons Paul intended for the Corinthians. Because for those who are tempted to take pride in their doctrine and their knowledge, there's a doctrinal lesson here. For those who are puffed up about the superiority of their particular brand of practical Christianity, there's some practical lessons here. And for those who are inclined to glory in men, there's a crucial lesson about the sovereignty and glory of God alone. So let's look at these questions one at a time. First, if you want to take notes, my outline is, it almost rhymes. First, there's a question that exalts God's sovereignty. Then there's a question that extols divine grace. And finally, there's a question that exposes human pride. And we'll look at them in that order. And if you want to take down that outline, I'll give it to you again point by point. First is a question that exalts God's sovereignty. A question that exalts God's sovereignty. Look at this first question. For who makes you different from anyone else? 